Mine eyes have seen the glory. The war is hell, there's no doubt about that. Of the coming of the Lord. Those guys laid it on the line every day. He is trampling out the vintage. That's what all the people fight for, is that flag. Where the grapes of wrath are stored. Just in one day there was 13. He hath loosed the fateful lightning. You go in as a boy, you come out as a young man. Of his terrible swift sword. Do you think about it every day still, or do you, is it far removed from your life now? His truth is marching on. It's pretty much removed. Glory, glory, hallelujah. I was there a week. I, I never thought I'd make it home. I was in the outfit for two weeks. We got ambushed out in the jungle and we lost 14 guys. Most of my squad was gone. It was just me and two sergeants left. He's going to die because he shot right here in the forehead. So when he turned over and I saw who it was, I went bananas. There's no reason I shouldn't have been killed dozens of times. A General White, I watched him die. I can see him right there if I really look, you know. I run down to the river, and I'm watching getting the blood off my hands. If somebody gets wounded, most of the time we never knew whether they made it or not. Glory, glory, hallelujah. 1969 when the United States government went from being drafted to a lottery system, I was number two. 13, and I had low numbers, so I was going anyway. 68, 69. I was in the Navy. Air Force. 66 to 70. They told me I was drafted and I was willing to go. On February 1st, 1953. I was drafted. And we went to Omaha and we enlisted and come home with, in the Army Air Corps. I was A1 on the draft list. Uh, I went in in December 1944. I was in the Army. I was in the uh, Air Force. 1960, the same year I graduated high school. In uh, November 1969. This is like my short time calendar. Because you never knew what day it was over there. Sometimes you'd go a week at a time and, not, and forget to even mark what day it is. We was on the flight line at night, you know, and they have big lights like you have to show on the planes. And you'd hear a thunk hit the plane, and it was certain times a year. And it was a big bug about four inches long, called a rice bug. And I'd sell them to the hooch girls who took care of the hooches where I lived for a nickel apiece, a bot apiece. And they'd just snap the head off and suck the rice out of it. And I was driving by there, I think I had a whole truckload of powder on. And here come this Arvin jet just off the runway, had a lift up right over me. And I could see the whites of his eyes. And he, his eyeballs was about that big around. And he just went over my truck and crashed right in the, there was a kind of a training field there for the Armit. And I just exploded. I was scheduled to be on the Indianapolis. About eight of us, they transferred us off of that roster over to the Vincennes, or I would have been on the Indianapolis, which was the last ship sunk. That was the darndest thing you ever imagined. Thank God, how in the world did I be so lucky? And I followed him with a gun, and they went down, and the guy said, why the hell didn't you shoot him? I didn't even see the Red Star. I didn't want to shoot that guy standing in that window. I would have felt bad. We had 5,000 Chinese prisoners of war. He said, uh, what was it like in Vietnam? I said, I'll tell you what, I'll go out in the cornfield and I'll hide in the cornfield. You come in and try and kill me. Oh, pretty bad, wasn't it? And I says, yeah. That was every day. I said, the marching was like anywhere from four to 10 miles a day. We were segregated then. And here they come just a marching like if they was doing it for a year. And us guys, every time we were out there the first week, everybody was stumbling over a bit. <laughs> you knuckleheads and just 
downgrading it as far as I could. I was, I was ready for it because I'd had stories told before, you know, of what their procedure was, you know, guys that had been through it, you know. We shoveled snow nightly at all hours. Well, we had jumping jacks. You had to learn to march or left foot first. We would do a hundred push-ups and then he'd put us in what he called the front leaning rest position with just lock your elbows for a minute and then we did another hundred. I couldn't do it now. Test of the gas mask because you went into the gas chamber with your gas mask on then you had to take it off. Oh, we had to jump off of a high board into a swimming pool and uh, I thought that was fun because I was a pretty good swimmer, but it was surprising how many of them they had to push off. Because you had to be functional as a group, not as an individual. We was in pretty good shape when you got out. You always suck up to the cook. You got used to powdered eggs. They'd drop a loaf of first bread down to you. And the meat was spoiled. So we had Spam all, all month. And I still like Spam. Rice. Artificial potatoes and eggs. And them things warmed up taste terrible. Sea rations from more, left over from World War II. And they'd have these hamburgers wrapped up in tin foil, aluminum foil, whatever. I told my wife last night we were at the ball game in Verdigree, Nybrar Verdigree. I said, this tastes like a hamburger that I had in Vietnam. I was fortunate being a truck driver. I could go to any mess hall. We ate a lot of beans. Compared to the guys that were in country and had, had a love out of a can or something, I think I had it real well. I don't really care for the sauce they have over there. They call it Nook Mom. And I don't think I ever want to see that again. Not a lot of communications like there is today. It was all in, all in letters. Mainly letter back then, because my folks didn't have telephone back then. It's called a Mars call. So when you would say something, you'd have to say over. And then they would switch it. And then if she would say something, when she was done, she had to say over. Diana, my wife, started writing me when I was in Vietnam. So you knew her? She was in the neighborhood girl. So she just took it upon herself to write to a veteran. And uh, anyway, we hooked up when I got back. <laughs> well, it was strictly male because in fact, we was on a farm and didn't even have a telephone. I called home once. <laughs> Christmas time, everybody wanted to call home, and they did. But you, your calls were limited. You couldn't talk for 20 minutes. You could talk for maybe five or six. Oh, I tried to do it at least once a month, but I was bad at writing letters. I wrote letters. That was only, there was no, there was no internet or telephone or anything like that. If you've ever really been miserable, seasick, you, you really ask, Lord, take me now. I know one guy was on the toilet, just sitting on the toilet for two weeks. Every time we went to eat, and that ship went like this, all the trays of food just slid off the table and off the floor. You learned that you could sleep and hold on at the same time. Anything that you did, you almost had to have your serial number. Nine five seven nine five three eight. AF one six eight five nine one one two. Nine one eight nine 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 eight. You never forget it. Well, you had to have it, or you didn't get paid. Forget never it. forget it ever. That's where I learned a jitterbug. When you got there, you just walked in, got in line, and the girls were lined up here, and then the always the first ones that got to dance and. And uh, I really, I was a good jitterbugger. I could have really, at the, you know, I was only 18, 19. I got to see quite a few uh, uh, Hollywood people. Kay Kaiser's band, I remember him. He was there several times. This would be the GI's favorite, I'm sure. <laughs> That's Ann Margaret. So how come you got to take these pictures? Well, I was just there with my camera. And lots of guys took pictures, but not everybody had the, the option of going to the base to get them cleaned up, you know, our base photography unit, and they just blew them up for me and stuff. <laughs> There's lots of people had pictures. These are just one among many. And this is Bob Hope, guys. This is a good deal. This is a happy memory, but, you know, when you stay someplace for 365 days or a year, 
That's a, you know, you need more than one of these days to kind of get along with yourself. I wouldn't mind doing it again <laughs> for two years, so. Well, it's one of those experiences, I don't want to do that again. But if I had missed it, I would have missed quite an experience. Yeah, I don't regret it. It was, it was an experience I could have done without it. You come out a new person, you, you were thinking for yourself. I had mixed feelings about going home. I got to liking it so much there. Even at my age, I'd do it again. If I had to do it over, I'd do it again. You did it because, not because you wanted to, you were first, you were expected to, and you did it out of respect for the country. Oh yeah, I'll do it again. When we got back from Vietnam into Seattle, there was protesters there spitting at us and calling us names and everything, but when I got back here, I never had any of that kind of trouble. It gets worse as I get older because I have less to do, more time to think about it. To this day, I and I go through it once in a while. Not as nothing like I used to. Because there was something that really bothered me. Kids today need to think about serving their country. We'd have more respect for the country, for the flag. They don't realize today what they really have. And they need to give back. I think it's just an experience that you need to have, you know, to grow up. I've always been maintaining that uh, too bad they stopped the draft. Maybe they'd actually realize uh, there's a reason why they have it so good. This is very important. It's still important to me to flag. Anytime I'm uh, something, I'm not doing something, I think about it, yeah. It hasn't, it hasn't affected my life. You know, I still got a wife and kids. Because this country has given me a lot. And we need to give back. <laughs>